The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the Art Dubai Art Fair, video art and politics at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the ceramic artist Lucy Ree. As the Art Dubai Fair opens, the art newspaper's acting digital editor Amy Dawson tells us about this latest edition, its continued commitment to digital art and the communities it reaches. This weekend, the Museum of Modern Art in New York opens the largest media exhibition it's ever staged called Signals, How Video Transformed the World. It looks at how artists around the globe have used video as a network technology capable of reaching huge audiences, but also reflected on or engaged in activism and urgent political flashpoints. I talked to the show's curators, Stuart Comer and Michelle Kuo. And this episode's work of the week is a coffee pot and milk jug by Lucy Ree, the great modernist potter. I talked to Eliza Spindle, co-curator of the exhibition Lucy Ree, the Adventure of Pottery at Kettles Yard in Cambridge, UK. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, while much of the rest of the world continues to struggle economically, the United Arab Emirates economy is estimated to have grown by 7.6% in 2022, the highest figure in 11 years. It's against this backdrop that the Art Dubai Fair this week opened its biggest edition yet. Amy Dawson, our acting digital editor, is in Dubai, and she gave me her impression of the fair and the wider scene. Amy, before we talk about this year's edition, could we just sort of recap about Art Dubai, what it is? And in a way, it's important to, to establish who it caters for, the kind of communities that are represented, if you like, at the fair. Yeah, so Art Dubai, this is now its 16th edition, which is quite significant for a fair within the region. Um, it's certainly one of the earliest established fairs in the Middle East. They like to use this term Global South and actually one of the major team members, the Global Art Forum Commissioner Shimon Bassar, was saying about how they use the term Global South and when they started using it 10 years ago, it was kind of a contested term. And increasingly now it's been accepted and is used by what we now term the Global South, which is kind of the Middle East, North Africa, Africa in general, South Asia, And that's really certainly the basis that they cater for at the fair. And most of the galleries are from the region. Lots of the audience is also from the region. But of course, there are international collectors and institutions and so on that come to the fair. And there are some bigger galleries like Peritan, which recently opened a gallery in Dubai. And there are, of course, galleries from New York and London that attend. But... The fair really does pride itself on being that meeting point for people from the region to come and for the international community to come and see what is new and leading from the region. Right. Tell us about the kind of economic atmosphere at the moment in Dubai, because, of course, in, in the global north, a lot of focus is on extraordinarily rising inflation and possible recessions left, right and centre. What's the economic situation in Dubai right now? Yeah, Dubai seems to be doing very well. I mean, it it always gives off this image of affluence and, you know, the towering skyscrapers and glossy portrayal of it is always, I think, the first thing you think of when you think of Dubai and the Emirates in general. But Dubai's come out of the pandemic pretty well. It had a really good vaccination program. It was one of the leading countries in the world for that. And it had a lot of government support, obviously helps that it's a very rich oil state, the UAE as a whole, not Dubai specifically. So yeah, it came out quite well and it didn't have a hugely negative impact economically compared to lots of countries in the world. So that's the first thing. And then also currently, there's a lot of talk about how Dubai in particular is benefiting from a huge influx of wealthy people and a lot of these people are moving here or buying second, third, fourth homes here and data is showing that a lot of these people are Russians or in some cases Ukrainians that are fleeing the war 
And this influx of money is really driving up real estate. It's helping out sectors that were struggling a little bit during the pandemic, like the entertainment and hospitality industries. And because the UAE hasn't sanctioned Russians, as many of the countries in the West have, there's lots of talk of this money maybe being kind of dirty money entering the country, money laundering and things like that. But obviously, it's not really possible to say definitively whether that is the case. Is there any sense in which that wealth is also present in terms of art collectors? You know, because of course, we've heard a lot about Russian art collectors and how they've driven various economies over the world or been a crucial part of the art economy. Is that something you could establish with the people who run the fair or anything like that or any of the gallerists indeed? Yeah, so actually the organisers, I spoke to the first executive director, Benedita Gioni, yesterday and she says that they've not seen a notable increase of any particular nationality on their kind of like invite or patron lists and there isn't a Ukrainian or a Russian gallery here at the fair, which is, I think, because it would be very contested. Last year, there was a Georgian gallery that did like a very poignant protest about the situation by laying down a Ukrainian flag. But this year, there's really not been anything particularly obvious. So there hasn't been any definitive answer to that question. I could certainly hear a lot of Russian speaking people at the fair. Last night was the VIP opening. I certainly did see Russian people, but no one is saying that it's more or less than before. I think everyone's kind of very sensitive to the fact as well. So I think that maybe, you know, we'll have to kind of wait for the data to be released and and perhaps next year it'll be a clearer image. But everyone wants to distance themselves from the idea that this is now a playground for Russian runaways. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of the vibe at that opening, because you were there last year, obviously, and that was the first fair after the pandemic. Does it compare favourably? Is it significantly different in any way? Yeah. So last year, the fair was the biggest it had been. And this year, again, they're saying it is bigger still. Last year, it was kind of the first event, certainly that I've been to, and I think that a lot of people had been to where it had returned to big crowds. And so it kind of felt a bit more overwhelming for that fact. And everyone was still wearing masks last year. And this year, it really was a return to normal. And there were still lots of crowds. It was very difficult to move around in the gallery halls. Lots of well-heeled people, lots of champagne being served, which is, you know, really the vibe of the fair in general. So certainly there were lots and lots of people there. The Julius Bayer kind of VIP lounge was overflowing and the general mood seemed very optimistic. And in terms of the fair offer this year, you broadcast from the fair last year where you were talking about this extraordinary sort of burst of NFTs in particular, but digital art in general. Is it different this year? We've heard so much about the NFT bubble bursting. Art Basel Miami Beach was notable for the for the relative lack of NFTs, for instance, compared to the previous year. What about Art Dubai? Last year was the first year that they introduced this digital section And it was really interesting. Dubai positions itself as a technology hub, a very future looking city. You know, they've got the Museum of the Future that opened last year. All of their kind of government plans and visions are like Vision 2050. And it's all very forward looking. And so it made sense for this section to open at the fair. Last year, as you say, the buzzword was NFTs. You couldn't escape them. This year, the section's actually bigger. It's 22 exhibitors compared to 17 last year. I think it's slightly telling that only four of those are returning organisations. But where NFTs last year were really in your face, there were so many screens everywhere. This year, it's very much more underground. That's not to say that there aren't NFTs. Certainly, there are lots. But it's not the first question you ask. It's not the main kind of selling point it's i don't know more of a given more accepted so that was quite interesting i think that this section this year feels a lot more curated it's very much more alive to the idea of putting this digital art within an art historical context which i think was a bit missing last year so it's kind of just reminding people digital art is not brand new (laughs) you know it didn't just land in dubai last year and i think that Credit should really go to the curator of the section, Clara Pei, who is a Singapore-based writer and curator. 
And she specializes in NFTs and digital art, and particularly those of the global south, which is really important, of course, for the fair. And the galleries are showing works by artists like Brendan Dawes, who's being shown with Gazelli, who has been working in this sphere for the last three decades. Unit London Gallery are showing these beautiful, colorful, geometric digital works by artists including Zach Lieberman and Finger Code. And they're reflecting on the legacy of op art. And so, you know, there's just a bit more of a feeling that it's more in keeping with the rest of the fair, like looking at connections it makes with other parts of the industry and art history. And generally, this section is a lot more slick. Last year, I think, you know, technology was kind of trying to catch up with NFTs in the same way that I think the art crowds were trying to. So, you know, there are a lot less technical hiccups. It looks a lot more swish and it was better laid out. There was more time to be able to spend down there, seating areas for collectors to come and sit and properly talk about the works rather than rush through a bunch of flashing screens. So that was really nice. They've always coined this term fidgetal, haven't they? This horrible term, which means physical and digital. But it sounds like what they're doing this time is actually much more in keeping with that word as opposed to a sort of just a relentlessly kind of screen-based approach, as you said. Yeah, definitely. I think there is a lot more physical than <laughs> digital um, right. this year. There were works that were inspired by digital rather than being really obviously digital. There were a lot more kind of prints that were taken from, you know, stills of videos or sculpture that's 3D printed. So there is a lot more kind of physicality in the booths rather than just screens or as has increased this year, these immersive experiences. And um, I know that Refik Anadol, who's the artist who's got a show at MoMA at the moment, is has got a work there as well. How was that? Yeah, so in the Julius Bayer Lounge, there's a immersive room by Rafik Anadol. It's the classic kind of swirling, abstract, AI, digital screens. And, you know, it's big and very impressive. And there were cues kind of to get in there. And his work is also on show with Pilevnelli Gallery in the digital section. And there are a few works by him ranging between $100,000 for video <laughs> and 200 ETH which is around $330,000 for um, his NFT video works. So he also was on show last year and a piece by him sold for $100,000. It was one of the, if not the most expensive work that sold in the digital section. So he's really having a moment and yeah, people are excited to see his work. I mean, some, it's not for everyone. I read a piece by Jerry Saltz who described his MoMA piece as a glorified lava lamp. So um, <laughs> there's definitely an appetite here for that kind of work. Immersive experiences are really popular in Dubai. But there's also a modern section, isn't there? Tell us about that. Yeah, the modern section is actually one of my favourite sections. It's where galleries highlight single artist presentations from masters within the region. And this year, there's some really lovely examples. There's a lovely booth with work from the Jordanian artist Mona Saudi, who's with Laurie Shabibi Gallery. She sadly died last year and she makes beautiful sculptures and silkscreen prints. And they're showing a collection from the late 1970s and 80s, which incorporate texts by Mahmoud Dawish, the famed Palestinian poet who was a friend of the artist. And it also includes some of Saudi's never before seen sketchbooks and drawings, which just offer a really incredible insight into her practice and process. And her daughter, who's also an artist, Dia Batal, was present at the gallery and it was very moving for her and for the gallery to be showing these works posthumously. So that was really lovely. And also there were wonderful presentations by the Syrian German painter Marwan who sadly also now passed away by the Sphere Semler Gallery, a collection of works by the Iranian artist Manir Shahroudi Fama Famein with the Third Line Gallery, and also some really, really beautiful photographs by the Ghanaian artist James Barna at October Gallery. So this was a really strong section, I think. Absolutely. I mean, you've been sort of visiting the region. It's sort of your specialty, as it were. How does it feel now in terms of its position within the scene that you've seen growing over the past few years? 
Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt in the fact that it's the most significant fair within the region. It's so established now. And it has really grown in its messaging, in its focus. It no longer tries to reach those big Western galleries and pull them in. You know, I think they find it much less of a calling card to have the blue chip galleries there. And and they really do pride themselves on bringing in lesser known galleries from the global south and lesser known artists. And they do work a lot on building up the infrastructure. You know, this is now the 16th edition. And when they started, you know, there really wasn't much of an art scene here. And so a lot of what they've been doing is cultivating a art community. And that is really reflected in the fact that the Art Dubai group is both a public and private joint venture business. So it's owned by Dubai International Finance Centre, which is public, and the Middle East Art Fairs Limited, which is private. Although they wouldn't disclose to me what the split was in that partnership. So there isn't so much of a commercial focus as there are for some fully private businesses that are art fairs. Um, So they are able to do more outreach and education and put on non-profitable enterprises at the fair. And I think that really, really does show. And they are really important now in bringing new artists to the fore. Lots of institutions come to find out what's going to be new and interesting in the scene. Guggenheim Abu Dhabi team I met yesterday who are, you know, the next big museum that is meant to be opening in Abu Dhabi in the next couple of years and they're still building their collection although they already have a huge collection and so you know it's important that these institutions as well they come and they see what is important and missing from their collection that they should be adding. I was wondering about that sort of rippling across the UAE because, of course, we've just done a piece here on the podcast about the Sharjah Biennial. It feels like a sort of moment now. Do they share those moments or is there a sort of protective, you know, individuality about the Emirates as they stand? Yeah, it's really interesting, the dynamic between the Emirates. And I mean, the main kind of cultural centres within the UAE, in terms of the Emirates, there are seven. So Sharjah has the Sharjah Art Foundation It has the biennial that recently opened. It seems more of a grassroots organization. They do a lot of artist commissions and residencies, prizes. They've got the African Institute there. There's a lot of focus on education. And so that has its own impression. And then Dubai is very commercial. Art Dubai obviously has a art market focus. You get things like Christie's here, lots and lots of galleries lots of gallery sections so there is kind of more of a commercial feel to Dubai and then Abu Dhabi is where the big museums are so you've got the Louvre Abu Dhabi the NYU Abu Dhabi which has a you know important gallery and soon to be the Guggenheim and so that kind of feels a bit more the big institutions and as well it's significant of course that those are outposts of western institutions so we've the Guggenheim and the Louvre. So international partnerships on that scale are really important to Abu Dhabi. And between the three of them, they kind of make quite a cohesive ecosystem for the art world. And they are dependent, I think, on each other and they feed into each other. But I do also see in the next couple of years, a growing competition between them as they kind of venture into each other's very established sections of the art world and I think you know there's there's some news that's embargoed at the moment that will be coming out that I think will reflect that there is some stepping on the toes but they are sister states at the end of the day so we shall see well watch this space for that embargoed news Amy (laughs) thank you very much thanks very much Art Dubai continues until Sunday, the 5th of March. You can read Amy's reports on the fair at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, video art and politics in New York and Lucy Ree in Cambridge. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. 
A new EU tax directive will dramatically raise the cost of selling art in France, according to Art Trade Insiders. The leading dealer, Tadeus Ropak, warned that the rule would be fatal for the country's art market, undermining Paris's recent resurgence as a market centre. The directive seeks to set the import sales tax of goods, including works of art, at 20% for all EU members, and also derail a margin scheme widely used by French dealers that reduces the amount of VAT paid on works of art. The directive was quite quietly adopted by the European Commission on the 5th of April last year, but only came to the attention of the wider art and antiques industry following a report in the French financial daily Les Echo last week. France is particularly affected because it levies the EU's lowest import tax on works of art at 5.5%, considerably lower than other EU countries like Germany at 19%. Museums have begun to update the nationality of various historic artists in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Stedlik Museum in Amsterdam has reclassified Kazimir Malevich, the leader of the suprematist art movement, as Ukrainian rather than Russian. Malevich was born in the Ukrainian capital Kiev in 1879 when it was part of the Russian Empire. Meanwhile, curators at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York have reclassified as Ukrainian three artists previously described as Russian. Ivan A. Vazovsky, Kip Quinji and Ilya Repin. And the UK's £300 million National Lottery Heritage Fund, which has supported some of the most notable museum projects in recent decades, has announced significant changes to its funding priorities in order to address concerns regarding the health and future of Britain's heritage. New buildings will now be discouraged in favour of longer-term benefits. Simon Thurley, the organisation's chair, wrote that investment has to be in the whole heritage infrastructure of a place, not just individual museums, galleries and heritage sites, and that the fund will intensify by its investment in high streets, parks and gardens. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This season, Christie's presents an exciting series of three auctions of prints and multiples in London and New York, offering prints and editions from the 20th century to now. Contemporary Edition showcases Christie's global presence in this field, with an online sale in London until the 14th of March and a live auction in New York on the 8th of March, which features prints by the likes of Richard Serra, Ellsworth Kelly and Alex Katz from the collection of Kenwell Steel, sold in support of the American non-governmental organisation glad. Alongside this, the online sale of prints and multiples, open until the 16th of March, focuses on editions by leading modern masters. Highlights across these sales include works by Picasso, Matisse, Warhol, Banksy, Herring and Kusama. Elsewhere, don't miss the final chance to bid on works by leading artists working today in the online auction of First Open, from Caroline Walker to Jonas Wood, Abudia and Tracy Emin. Bidding closes on the 9th of March. You can find out more about the auctions at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, on Sunday, the exhibition Signals How Video Transformed the World opens at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It features around 70 works drawn mostly from MoMA's collection, making it the biggest ever media exhibition held at the museum. Among the works are key pieces by celebrated video pioneers like Nam June Paik and John Comfra, as well as more recently emergent artists like Sandra Perry and Tiffany Sia. I spoke to the two curators of the show, Stuart Comer and Michelle Kuo. Stuart, I noticed in your essay that there's a clear attempt in this show to kind of disrupt a, an ongoing binary between video art and television. And there's this idea that the one thing is always versus the other. And you want to disrupt that somehow or complicate it. Can you explain more about that? I think video has often been framed in terms of its relationship to either cinema or increasingly to television. And I mean, amongst many reasons, obviously the internet has radically transformed our notion of television to begin with. And so even the question of broadcast means something very different now. Um, but regardless, as with television now, Instagram or many other platforms are controlled by various corporations, in some cases by the state. So that has actually not changed. But we felt that, you know, the sort of viral mechanism of the internet has only amplified the ability of artists to get the message out. And so it's no longer bound by the conventions of broadcast television. The whole situation is so fluid and it has made, you know, video and images more fluid themselves, um, which is both 
extremely exciting uh, as an artistic premise, but also extremely challenging. And so I think the show is in general kind of constantly toggling back and forth between contesting forms of control, but also, you know, reveling in the possibilities of the technology and, and the ability to create instant global networks. Absolutely. And Michelle, it, it's not a survey. You're very clearly pointing that out. But tell me what you've done then. If you're not doing a survey, how do the works sort of unite? Or is there a sort of guiding principle that you've used in terms of the selection of the work? Yes. So we use the metaphor of a lens of reframing and focusing in a way in on what we see as a subset of works that are, first of all, in MoMA's collection by and large, which itself tells an interesting story, um, but also that are really pivoting around this question of publics, the public sphere, um, creating new types of publics and communities um, and networks, but also the breakdown in some cases of those networks. So in a word, this is a lens on video and politics because you see how artists from the mid 1960s when video recorders and cameras become more accessible, uh, lower cost for individual consumers, you don't have to go to a big professional broadcasting studio, but that opened up uh, a chance for what many saw as a democratization of the medium, of the media. And that word democratization is not an accident. You know, artists are really dreaming of connecting with others and sometimes at massive scales that were never possible before. Um, by the time you get to New Year's Day 1984, Nam June Paik uh, broadcasts his um, amazing piece in New York and Paris called Good Morning, Mr. Orwell to 25 million people around the world. So there's this dream of kind of global connectivity and also multi-way communication. That's why many artists are, are trying to actually get away from uh, existing models of television or TV at the time. They're trying to say, this is not a top-down communications network. This could be a multi-way channel. They dreamed of <laughs> essentially what could be something like the internet. At the same time, they're already realizing that those dreams are fraught with phenomena like surveillance, disinformation, um, the breakdown of communication, or in fact, the idea that certain kinds of information may spread farther and faster than the truth. So these are all issues that artists are grappling with, they're fascinated by, and they have really different reactions to it. And they make, you know, marvelous and, and sort of experimental works through that interest. And Stuart, one of the interesting things to me is the way that artists have, in a way, resisted professionalism, resisted tropes of slickness or resisted a sort of form of obviousness in terms of the way that they've used the technologies. Can you say something more about that? Because it's almost like a political decision as well as a sort of formal one, right? One of my favorite categories in general is the brilliant failure. And we have two really great examples in this show. One is the Nam Chun Paik work that Michelle just mentioned, Good Morning, Mr. Orwell, which is notorious at various moments where it was complete meltdown. George Plimpton was drunk. You know, people were falling down on set. It was in some ways a disaster and yet a tremendous success, you know, and it reached over 20 million people and revolutionized the potential of the medium in many ways. And similarly, Marta Minyohin's Simultaneity and Simultaneity, which was meant to be one third of a three country happening in collaboration with Wolf Fostel in Berlin and Alan Capro in New York. Her work invited a number of public personalities and celebrities in Buenos Aires to come to a television station where their images were recorded and then played back to them so that they were encountering their own digital shadow, as it were. And so not all the technology worked. Um, the dream of having this three-way global happening was not a complete reality in the end, but just the premise is so exciting. And her uncanny ability to kind of recognize the importance of global simultaneity just for us was a watershed moment to think about for this exhibition. And Michelle, when you've 
involved works from the past here. You've obviously gone back through the decades. Did the works need to have a kind of prescience or a relevance or an ongoing significance today that perhaps there are other works that are in MoMA's collection don't in terms of, again, not just formally, but also, you know, their political or activist mentalities? We chose works that we felt absolutely resonated with very, very current issues. And in some cases, because those issues were already going on at the time. So in the mid 60s through the next decades, artists are grappling with questions of what they think is the mainstream media. Is it state controlled or is it uh, controlled by corporations? How could we potentially create our own media, our own networks? Literally, some artists created their own collective and their own pirate television station. And artists were interested in these formats almost as they were interested in um, other artistic media. So you even have an artist like Richard Serra, who's experimenting with sculptural materials. At the very same time, he is experimenting with video, which we think is fascinating. And so this idea that these artists at the time were confronting questions of media control, questions of truth and falsity, of surveillance and witnessing, but also larger issues that people are grappling with questions of globalization, ecological disaster, uh, military conflict, fear of automation and technology, and is the machine going to you know, take over our lives? Video was seen as something that was, was not art. It was by and large associated either with dreadful kitsch, it will turn you into a couch potato, or something that was sinister and was going to control your mind. So these are all interventions that artists were making, and they actually hold uh, quite consistently, <laughs> for better or for worse. Uh, we're still dealing with a lot of the same issues, of course, uh, at different scales and, and modes, but we, we see a lot of continuity there. Absolutely. And Stuart, there's a sort of wonderful sense, I always think, with new technology, where artists on the one hand are excited by the possibilities, and especially when it's something like a porter pack, that first really portable technology, which allows them so much freedom and it's affordable and so on. But also that obligation, I would say, of an, of an artist to subvert the very technology that they're involved in. Is that something that's common to all of these artists? There's a sense in which it has to involve a certain critique of the medium, as well as a kind of embrace of it. I think because the medium, and I would just point out, I think Michelle and I are both eager to suggest that it is not a medium. In fact, it's a system, a technology and a network rather than a conventional medium. You can't locate it only within an image, but really it is about how that image connects things or otherwise, um, again, builds or dismantles entire societies. And so to that end, I think the sort of euphoria with which new technologies are often adapted is immediately accompanied by the more sinister side. So I think artists are to some extent beholden to acknowledge that and that you know they know that the system they are engaging with uh, is producing something of enormous significance on a really significant scale. And so there is no neutrality here, I think. But if, you know, again, an artist I know always says that anyone who would suggest that painting itself is not political, the moment you put a brush to canvas is a political act. So it's not that video you know, has a monopoly on being political, but there is something about even the resistance to accepting video as a quote unquote legitimate art form for decades. Um, and in some ways that still persists because it was seen as a mode of either entertainment or information and those were not seen to be art. So our argument really is that this entire system is a sort of plasma for making art and that it is really fluid, it's ever changing which is why it is so sinister potentially. And so it is crucial that artists really do create a tighter frame for us to really look forensically at what is going on. So we develop our own critical tools to navigate a world of total immersion in electronic images. I think many of the artists we've selected precisely because they're not just for or against something. Exactly. They are actually asking different questions often, which is, okay, a technology exists, I'm not just going to simply reject it, but maybe I'll take it and do something else with it, 
or maybe I will change it, or maybe I will embrace it, but I'm still going to um, try and alter the way that it is seen in the world. So I think that's kind of different than saying I'm just critical or I'm affirmative. It's saying I want to turn the tables a bit. And why would I let corporations and governments and universities control a technology and dictate the terms by which I, an individual, am receiving that technology? Why can't I get in there and do something with it? Some people might see that as naive or romantic, but in fact, at the same time, these artists are absolutely cognizant, in fact, deeply cognizant of precisely the kinds of issues and uh, dangers of the technologies they're dealing with. And of course, when we talk about dangers, there's different like levels of danger, if you like, across the sphere of the kind of works that you're involving here. Because on the one hand, you have artists who are right at the heart of countries with autocratic regimes who are actually taking risks by going out onto the streets and making videos, for instance, Stuart. So can you say something about that? About, you know, obviously you've deliberately gone for a very transnational, really broad geographical mix. And there are different levels of risk at play, aren't there? And, and again, we take risk to mean all sorts of things in these contexts. Absolutely. And I mean, one of the questions we think is important to state up front is this show is not just about signals. It's what happens when the signal isn't there. What happens when the signal is shut down? So there's a really key installation by Dara Birnbaum looking at the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989. And you literally see the state shut down, down rather mid broadcast. And then equally on a different monitor in the same work, you see students actively resorting to fax machines and other forms of information dissemination um, because the signal in fact, is no longer there. But one thing that is not in this show at the moment is an artist working on the front lines in Tehran at the moment. And Bidun magazine actually recently published a new fantastic diary, which looked at graffiti in the streets. That was almost the moment after that photograph of each graffiti was taken, erased. Clearly, video has a digital footprint in a way that it is easily traceable. So that does put people in the current situations in Iran or Ukraine, for instance, in an enormous risk, potentially. I had done a previous exhibition at MoMA called Transmissions. It was looking at art in Eastern Europe and Latin America between 1960 and 1980. And similarly, a, a lot of those artists were working under conditions of dictatorship. And so they had to resort to mail art or to other forms of alternative distribution to um, circumvent the official system, whether it was official broadcast, official museums, state-run, corporate-run, or otherwise, you know, they had to get the message out somehow. And so they found tactics to do that. So to that end, I think Amar Kanwar's installation as well, The Torn First Pages, is about the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar. And it literally focuses on a bookseller who each time he would sell a book would rip out the first page, which was imprinted with propaganda from the government. And so it was a really risky um, endeavor, but also we do think about video in terms of you know, the bookseller, in terms of someone trying to distribute information and finding ways to do that meaningfully in very difficult circumstances. And Michelle, there's a really interesting text by Tiffany Sia in the catalogue where she's talking about this extraordinary film that she's made on the streets of Hong Kong during the 2019 protests. And the way that she describes it is in itself courageous, I think, because she's talking about it as an everyday phenomenon. She's saying anybody with an iPhone could have made this film. There's a kind of modesty in that, but there's also a sort of a commitment to the form, if you like, a commitment to the making of the video that really stands out from that text, I think. Can you say more about it? Absolutely. I think for Tiffany, the very act of recording is itself a brave act in certain circumstances. And so she talks about that. And I think you see that reflected in the work itself. You have this sense of it being at some times a very intimate, almost clandestine recording. And at the same time, you see also the ways in which the quality of life as an activist is permeating every aspect of experience. And that's why there's so much downtime, there's so much waiting, there are all these moments in which you don't see a kind of spectacle of political action, you actually see what that means for everyday life. And I think that in and of itself is an act of courage. Tiffany also talks about the fact that she was very careful to, of course, conceal the identities of those that appear on her footage. And she herself then eventually left Hong Kong, in fact, and now is based in Brooklyn. 
I, I think a lot about Tiffany's work and this work in particular in relation to Alan Sakula's work and especially a work like Waiting for Tear Gas that looked at the uh, WTO protests in Seattle in the 90s. But, you know, whereas Alan was really resorting to the still image and these kind of slide shows and it slowed things down so that the viewer would really focus on the image and those images were constructed specifically as a counterpoint to the media's construction of the same event and so that was a very different form of criticality and i think to focus on the iPhone, its framing, its cadence, and the moving image, which is more slippery and more fugitive. That prompts an interesting set of questions that I think Tiffany is extremely eloquent in framing. I wanted to ask about the iPhone and the fact that that so many people now have them. And as you point out in the catalogue, video has become so ubiquitous it's it's part of all of our lives does that make it harder for artists in a way to somehow find a way to make what they do stand out or even act as art michelle I think that the artists who are interested in video use it often precisely because it is ubiquitous and because it is something that is so pervasive it is also something that in many ways, many people can relate to. And that makes it uh, more interesting in many ways as a format. But I think also they're interested in precisely the way that video is something that is sent. It is part of a network and that's how it becomes (laughs) so pervasive in the first place. I think video does relate to a long history of appropriation and frankly of the ready-made and to, you know, I I see it as very related to the history of the collage and clearly, you know, there were a lot of political collagists in the early 20th century, particularly in Germany and Russia. And I, I think that is for me a crucial precedent for the work we're looking at in this show. Lastly, I wanted to ask about putting together a show like this, because of course, in a way you have the hardest job of all curators, I think, in terms of if you're dealing with video, you're dealing with time-based media, how do you make it a show which people can come to and get everything that you want to tell them when there's so much that they need to see? You know, each film has a certain length, etc., etc. Are you allowing people to come back to the museum to see it more than once, for instance? Do you feel the need to encapsulate everything within a a single visit and so on? Uh, Stuart, maybe you can reflect on that. This is a very important question and one we've given a lot of thought to. And one outcome of those conversations is that we do have an online channel. So it is geared primarily to a selection of single channel works in the show. So it doesn't represent every work in the show by any means, but it does represent the deep holdings the museum has that I think are a very important representation of that history. And so we've broken them down into specific groupings, um, sort of rough categories. And so that will be online for the duration of the show. And for many reasons, rights issues, and otherwise a lot of that material is not always easy to see. So we think this is a very important pilot and I hope someday down the line we'll be able to make much more of the collection available to the public for free, which would frankly realize the dreams of the earliest video collectives, which was open distribution. So that's one key part of it. I think you know, some of this work doesn't necessarily require that you watch it from beginning to end. And that's where I think it is very different from other forms of video, which I think it's essential that you, even if you walk into it in the middle of the work, you do need to sort of encounter the whole piece. But again, you can experience some of this work in fragments. And this is why somebody like Tiffany Shaw or Artur Zmijewski is, we feel, critically important because of their incredible ability to frame this material so that you do understand immediately what's at stake. So you don't actually have to watch, you know, all of the hours of footage to understand the point that they're making. But that said, we've tried to make the show as user-friendly as possible. We've worked closely with our AV team and our IT team to develop a listening uh, technology with Sennheiser called Mobile Connects so that uh, for certain works, you know, there are headphones provided by the museum or you can use your own to listen to the works. So that is one thing that we really hope will make it uh, more user friendly. But, you know, clearly we don't expect people to watch every second of every video in this show. So we've tried to structure it and work with our exhibition designers to, you know, make the key points. And hopefully someone that only has 30 minutes to an hour will walk away, you know, thinking about the fundamental questions we want to ask. 
Many of the works are also structural and physical, and so you might experience them almost as something that has quote unquote infinite duration. Like a sculpture doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Some of these works, in the same way, are phenomenal experiences that you encounter and that you don't have a linear experience with them. The opening work of the show, in fact, or one of them, is Gretchen Bender's TV text and image, which was originally shown across the street from MoMA. The public library on the street, but it is still streaming television. So it's always updating itself. And then the text that Bender overlaid on the screen for each monitor still is uncanny. I mean, you literally cannot make up how uncanny the connections are um, between whatever the image is that it's updating itself and these very precise statements that ask pretty critical questions. Well, Stuart and Michelle, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much. Signals How Video Transform the World is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York from Sunday the 5th of March until the 8th of July. The catalogue I mentioned is published by MoMA and priced $45 or £51. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. More than a hundred of the ceramic artist Lucy Rees' works go on show from tomorrow in a major exhibition at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, UK, called The Adventure of Pottery. The show reflects Rees' whole career, from the early days in her native Vienna to work she made across seven decades in London after she fled Nazi persecution in 1938. Among them is a stoneware coffee pot and milk jug with a manganese glaze and sgraffito lines made in 1960. I spoke to a Eliza Spindle, the assistant curator of the house and collection at Kettle's Yard, about these objects. Eliza, this coffee pot and milk jug were created in 1960. Where was Lucy Ree at that time and where was she in her career at that time? Yes, so Lucy Ree was working in London. She had a studio uh, on a street called Albion Muse, which was just around the corner from Marble Arch in London. And she'd been there since 1939, having begun her career in Vienna, but as a Jew escaped persecution in 1938 and came to London in in 1938. And soon after that, arrived at her studio in London. And at that time, her reputation had grown, hadn't it? So she was an established artist. She was well regarded in 1960. She was well regarded. She had been a participant in the Festival of Britain in 1951, which was a significant moment of recognition for her, having been in the country only just over a decade. And she was supplying high-end department stores and small galleries in London and New York. So she was slowly building up a name for herself, mainly for functional tablewares and coffee sets and things like that. And these items are stoneware, which is crucial because she made a shift after the war, didn't she, from earthenware to stoneware. Tell us about the significance of that development in the work. Yes, so she started her career working mainly in earthenware, which is a softer clay body and it's fired at a lower temperature. So the resulting material is is slightly more porous and soft. Stoneware is fired at a higher temperature and is more durable. So it lends itself to functional ceramics like coffee sets. But it also was a crucial development in the way her work looked as well. She started working in stoneware in the late 1940s and installed a kiln that was capable of firing to that higher temperature. And the result of this higher firing temperature encourages a closer interaction between the glaze and and the clay beneath. And that would have quite a significant effect on the glazes that she was able to use and the effects that she could achieve and this kind of unity that she was able to create between the clay body and the glaze that she applied. She's famous for her raw glazing, isn't she? Is she still using that kind of raw glazing at this point? Because, of course, initially it was a kind of development by virtue of necessity. She needed to do things quickly. She didn't have much resource and therefore made a very sort of clear judgment that raw glazing was was important. But tell us what the implications are of that now when she's an established artist and therefore command, you know, has more resource, etc. Yes. So she starts using this raw glazing technique right at the beginning of her career. Um, rather than firing the pots first and then applying a glaze and firing again. 
she applies it to the raw clay and just fires it once. Um, and this is a way of kind of economising on time and also doesn't require her to transport her pots to a kiln across town twice but it also has a big impact on the way her pots look and the the techniques that she's able to use and crucially we can see in this coffee pot she uses the sgraffito technique where she's etching with a needle tool through the glaze revealing the color of the clay beneath and that's something that you can only do if you've applied the glaze to unfired clay because you can scratch into the surface um, and it's got enough softness to be able to do that. One of the intriguing things about that is that she's so associated with a kind of purist modernity she is a great modernist ceramicist and yet is it right that this emerged from actually an encounter with bronze age ceramics in wiltshire yes the story goes that she and hans coper the potter that was sharing her studio at the time visited avebury stone circle in wiltshire in the late 1940s and they visited the small museum there and encountered these Bronze Age bowls that had etched linear designs on the surface. And they were also displayed with the bird bones that had been used to create that design. And both Copa and Ree were incredibly taken with this technique and began to use it in their own work. And for Ree in particular, it became a real recognisable signature technique that you see in her work from that late 1940s moment all the way through to her work in the 80s and early 90s. And it's extraordinarily refined, isn't it? Just looking at these examples, that it's that she uses a steel needle, but they're still incredibly carefully done. It's so delicate as well as so extraordinarily bold as well as a gesture. Exactly. And she did it all freehand, which is astonishing when you look at some of the more intricate linear sgraffito designs that she's using on her work, that they're all accomplished freehand. And there's this amazing documentary with David Attenborough that we'll also be showing in the exhibition at Kettle's Yard, where you get to see her by now in her 80s, but still using this sgraffito technique and just with such confidence and such a steady hand etching these lines into the surface of her bowls and pots. It's great that you brought up David Attenborough because you've written an essay, haven't you, in the catalogue where you talk about her relationship with the natural world. And again, she's so often associated with the modern world and actually with sort of metropolitan kind of structures. People often relate her work to architecture of the period and so on. But your argument is that she was much more closely connected with nature than she's often given credit for. Yes. So she's so frequently described as a metropolitan potter, which is absolutely right. You know, she was working in first in central Vienna, but then in central London and rarely strayed from those two cities. But beneath that was this real intimate understanding and love of the natural world. And I think once you know that about her and see these objects in her collection as well, that she was collecting shells and pebbles and bits of coral, you can really start to see these influences present in her work, most obviously in some of the more sort of textural, earthy pieces but also the much more precise, linear sgraffito pieces like this coffee pot. You can certainly start to think about spiders' webs or the gills of a mushroom and the kind of underlying geometry present in the natural world that she's very interested in. And this is an interest that was shared by other contemporaries of hers, in particularly in kind of post-war British design, designers that were involved in the Festival of Britain like Lucien Day and her textiles, very much this interest in the kind of geometries and, and patterns in the natural world. That's really fascinating. Of course, one of the difficulties with Lucy Rhea is she was so reluctant to talk about her art, to talk about what she was doing, that it's difficult to know just how precisely she engaged with the natural world, how much she drew from it. And and therefore, is it all a bit of guesswork with her because she was so uh, reticent to talk about the work? Yes, it's quite difficult to unpick the influences behind a lot of her work. She didn't produce uh, sketchbooks per se. She didn't particularly talk about the inspiration, the influences behind her pots. But you can definitely start to sort of unravel and detect some of those influences, whether it's, you know, her training in Vienna in the early 20th century or, you know, mid-century British design and um, architecture or as I'm interested in the the natural world and, and the kind of objects that she herself collected and gathered in her studio. Alongside that sort of reluctance to speak, she was also quite modest about the engagement with modern design and, and with, the I guess, the intellectual structures of modern design, wasn't she? She talked about being more interested in beauty than in art theory, but nonetheless, she's clearly engaging with modernism, right? She is, and she trained at the Kunstgewerbeschule in Vienna, the School of Arts and Crafts. And one of the 
main tutors there was Joseph Hoffman, who was closely involved in the Vienna Werkstatter. So she was absolutely aware and assimilating all of these influences, both in, in Vienna and then later in London, being part of the Festival of Britain and working with designers. She died in 1995, but she, by that stage, achieved pretty huge fame for a ceramicist, hadn't she? She had retrospectives and so on. But there's this intriguing connection towards the end of her life with Issey Miyake. And this extraordinary, and people must look it up online, this extraordinary show that she had in Japan, which was in collaboration with Issey Miyake and the architect Tado Ando. And it seems to me extraordinary that there was this global appreciation of her work among circles far beyond the ceramic world or even the art world. Yes, so she first met Issey Miyake, I think, in 1982, and Miyake was a huge fan of her work. They formed quite a close friendship, but particularly Miyake was really taken with the ceramic buttons that she had produced in the 1940s during kind of wartime austerity when she was struggling to make ends meet by selling her pots. So these buttons had been sitting in her studio since the late 40s, and Miyake discovered them and used them in one of his fashion shows in 1989. And then Tado Ando's display, the ceramics were sort of set amid water, weren't they? Yeah, the Ando design included Lucy Rees pots sitting on these very narrow platforms in a sort of shallow pool of water that reflected the forms of the pots. So an incredible, atmospheric, beautifully elegant display. Absolutely. And of course, now you're putting on a display of her work. She talked about this idea of the silent grandeur and quietness, and it seems to me that's such a a potent way to describe the effect of her own pottery. And I imagine when you're putting on a show of the work, that must be very present in your mind. Her silence, if you like, that quietness that she chose, but also the incredible solemnity of her work. Yes, and we've tried really with the exhibition to, as much as possible, allow people to encounter her pots close up in this kind of contemplative way, appreciating the the poise and elegance and and beauty of them and having this really intimate encounter. At Kettle's Yard, where the exhibition is, we have a historic house with a collection in it, and this includes a number of Lucy Ree bowls that had been acquired by the owner of Kettle's Yard, Jim Ede. And these are not in display cases, they're on open display and very beautifully placed in the domestic spaces of the Kettle's Yard house. And I think that's sort of the benchmark that we're trying to aspire to with the exhibition, although we can't have them on open display, just having this intimacy of an encounter and the, the kind of balance and stillness of her work. Eliza, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks. Lucy Ree, The Adventure of Pottery, is at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, UK, from the 4th of March to the 25th of June. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Amy, Stuart and Michelle and Eliza. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.